Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's virtual book club. I'm Matthew Booker, Vice President for Scholarly Programs at the National Humanities Center, and your host for this evening's event. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that you must log in to participate in the discussion. You can do that by clicking the blue sign in button in the upper right hand corner of the page and entering your Gmail account. This conversation is part of an ongoing series of virtual book club gatherings with prominent authors. The themes this year have included loss and upheaval, race and injustice, and challenges to our democracy. Those are archived at nationalhumanitycenter.org. Tonight's event is the second in our series exploring conflict and resolution. Every Wednesday in February, we are joined by distinguished scholarly guests to discuss how the humanities may help us ease the bitter strife and rancor that increasingly marks our public discourse. Our guest this evening is Laura Edwards, class of 1921 bicentennial professor in the history of American law and liberty at Princeton University. Laura earned her PhD in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She taught at Duke University for 20 years before recently assuming her current position at Princeton. She is the author of four books which have received numerous awards, including the Southern Historical Association's Charles Sidner Prize for the best book in Southern history, and the American Histor Historical Association's Littleton Griswold Prize for the best book in American law and society. Her work has also been supported by fellowships from the American Council of Learned Societies, the American Bar Foundation, the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, the Newberry Library, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Smithsonian Institution, and the National Humanities Center. Laura's scholarship has primarily focused on law and society in the 19th century, especially on the radical transformations that resulted from the American Civil War and Reconstruction. She has graciously agreed to speak with us this evening about her most recent book on that subject, which explores how the notion of rights became integral to our national identity and changed the lives of all Americans, and especially African-Americans, women, and organized laborers. Please join me in welcoming Professor Laura Edwards. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, and thank you so much for the invitation. This is just a real pleasure, and I've been looking forward to it. Um, so I'm gonna dive in, right? And um, so the basic argument for this book, Legal History of Civil War and Reconstruction, is really pretty straightforward. I argue that you cannot understand this period without law. And by law, though, I mean something in a broader sense than just court decisions, legislation, and constitutional amendments, although all of those things, of course, are very important. The legal order is what I'm talking about, really, and that includes basic rules that order society more generally, some of which are not captured in formal written legal texts. And the legal order is also about people's relationship to law, how they use law, how they apply law, and what they expect law to do in their lives. So first, Civil War and Reconstruction, let's get this basics out of the way. Everybody kind of agrees that this period is one of the most, if not the most, transformative moments in US history, although perhaps we're going through a moment right now that's going to um, actually you know, contest that. But in this period, we start out with those heated debates about slavery and its expansion that leads the nation up to the brink. And then there was a step over the edge with secession, the creation of the Confederacy, the war, which dragged on for four long, deadly years. And then there was the defeat of the Confederacy and the enactment of the 13th Amendment, which ended slavery. That was followed up by an attempt to reconstruct the states of the former Confederacy around principles that ensured African-Americans basic civil and political rights. And those efforts resulted in two more amendments, the 14th and 15th Amendments, which gave the federal government oversight over civil and political rights and held out the promise of racial equality. Those amendments in turn resulted in even more dramatic change at the state and local levels, changes that ordinary Americans, both white and black, seized on to realize substantive change in their communities and their own lives. 
Those efforts, however, then unleashed backlash by former Confederates who snatched power and derailed reform until the 20th century. So that is the period in a nutshell. And this is all pretty heady stuff by itself without the integration of law. But once you center law in this history of the Civil War and Reconstruction, all the issues I think become even more dramatic and more charged. The Civil War and Reconstruction were both more and less transformative than we imagined when you focus on law. And the changes of this period then were more transformative in that they extended beyond questions of slavery and racial equality. Reconstruction brought the federal government into questions of individuals' legal status, an issue previously reserved to states. And as such, Reconstruction remade all Americans' relationship to the legal order and also recast their expectations of what it should do. And the changes of this era are also less transformative because they focused only on certain areas of law. This period elevated rights as the primary means of making claims in law and on government, but rights came with a downside in that they advanced individual claims rather than the kinds of sweeping systemic structural changes and problems that plague so many Americans, white and black men and women. The changes of this period, moreover, did not extend to other parts of the legal system where principles that supported profound inequalities were left in place. Those principles were a millstone dragging down the possibility of change. They limited the era's lofty promises, not only of racial equality, but also of a more accessible, responsible, responsive and just legal order for all Americans. Now, to be sure, politics was central in overthrowing Reconstruction. It is difficult to overstate the importance of former Confederates' violent acts and the inability of Reconstruction supporters to counter them. But that is not the whole story here. At issue was also the very legal system on which Reconstruction supporters relied. And that piece of history has profound implications for today. So, the plan here for the rest of this is I want to give you a couple of concrete examples about the changes that I'm talking about in this period, examples that show how people use law and how law, once activated, shaped change in unintended ways. And then I'm going to move outward briefly to consider some of the lessons for today. But before launching into the past, I want to start in on a personal note and explain how this book also changed me as a historian. And so I do so to introduce myself to you in hopes of making a human connection in this odd virtual world and I'm staring at my computer and there are all these people that I don't see out there. But I also do so because this personal anecdote is not just about me, it's also about the place of law in the United States today. The importance of history in shaping its meaning and also the imperative of understanding all of that. So when I first started writing this book, I did not think of myself as a legal historian, which is really odd because I did legal history all the time and have been doing it for a long time. I've taught a lecture course in legal history since 1998, which is longer ago now than I care to admit or think about much. And I have gone to legal history conferences since the 1990s when I was a graduate student. A previous book that I wrote received a prize in legal history. Clearly I can pass as a legal historian, but I didn't see myself that way. And I would kind of resist that categorization. I'm not really a legal historian, I'd say. So why? When I started this book, I still saw law as something apart from the social dynamics that were really my main interest. Law I saw was different. I did it, it was connected to other parts of history, but it was still different. And frankly, law still seemed kind of intimidating despite my engagement with it. It had this distinct off-putting language with lots of here and afters and therefores. And it had all those unattractive imposing gatekeepers, humorless white men, starch collars, sober suits, which is actually kind of like what I'm wearing right now, um, glaring from the past, right? And I could tell they didn't approve of me at all. And all that is the reason why I think many histories of this period, um, except law that those men penned and handed down, unquestioningly. Um, they look at court decisions, the statutes, the constitutional amendments, they call that the law. We assume that that's handed down and then you follow the implications. And so you kind of treat it with kid gloves. And I think it has something to do with those guys in the collars. As I realized in writing this book though, that conception of law as something handed down from on high owes to changes in the legal order that the civil war accelerated. Those changes took law from ordinary people and put it in the hands of those imposing professionally trained legal experts who then took it and scrolled it away in inaccessible parts of the legal system. 
that authority then uh, that local communities once had in the early 19th century to interpret and imply law, apply laws was slowly moved more to state legislatures, to US Congress and to high courts. And even in local communities, law became the province of legal professionals who identified themselves as the only ones who knew it, the only ones who could apply it, the only ones who could make it and the only ones who could amend it. Everyone else was made to feel as if they had kind of no clue, which is actually how most of us feel today, right? Um, but this is kind of an interesting story then because even as rights were extended, at least in theory, to more of the population in the late 19th and 20th century, the actual making of an interpretation of law moved further and further away from people's hands. But that is not how law worked in the mid 19th century. Many people then had a basic working knowledge of a range of legal principles, and they had to. They had to understand the rules of private law, what we now call civil law, because it governed the exchange of property. And basic transactions followed those rules, even if they were not contested in court. So you had to know them in order to move through basic parts of your life. People also had to understand the area of public law, which included criminal law, but also covered questions relating broadly to the public good, issues such as public health, social welfare, morals, and markets. So people, even those without rights, regularly weighed in on those kinds of matters. Um, and then when people went to court, when things went sideways, they did not always engage lawyers. So they would actually you know, run their own cases in court. When lawyers were involved, litigants did not cede all authority to them. They maintained very strong opinions about how the law should work, and they had absolutely no qualms about expressing them. And this was not just in the context of court cases. They did so at all levels of government. The institutional structure of the legal system made all that possible. While states, the federal government, they were all important lawmaking bodies, they weren't the only lawmaking bodies. Whole areas of law and its application were left to local areas, which were literally very close to people. And this is not just about geography either, it's about the logic of the law. We now think of rights as the legal tools necessary to access the legal system in government. Without them, you're on the outside, unable to act at all. And a lot of people in the 19th century were without them. So we assume they're on the outside. But in fact, rights were not necessary to access the legal system, at least parts of it in the 19th century. It's important and the possession of them reflected deep inequalities in American life, but government at all levels had other avenues that people could use to make claims. So what do I mean? A few examples might help here. So for instance, married women regularly marched down to local officials to a complaint of domestic violence committed by their husbands on their bodies. And officials acted, which might be surprising to you, but they did. And they did not because there was a law prohibiting domestic abuse, because there wasn't, or because a husband's violent acts violated a wife's rights, because they didn't. They acted because violence threatened the public order. It was considered disorderly to run around and beat your wife um, and do it in a way that was flagrant and excessive. So they put the kibosh on that as a way of then upholding the public order. Enslaved people then, another example, sustained legal claims to certain kinds of property, not just because they had property rights, because they didn't, but because long-standing legal principles allowed people without property rights to basic essentials of life, namely food and clothing. Now, those principles are scattered through legal text, but they were very long-standing and existed more strongly in practice, and people kept them alive by using them and insisting on them. Then at the state and federal level, people also had other ways into government. And one of the most important is the right of petition. And this is a formalized process, it required a response though. You had to respond to petitions, both at the state and federal level. You didn't always have to act, but at least you had to engage the petitioners. So none of these elements created an, an egalitarian world. The law exacted very harsh punishments. It upheld rigid inequalities. Still, people did not see it as something apart from their lives, kind of hovering over them, out of reach, a dark cloud in the sky. It was there instead all the time, more like mist, embedded in everyday life in ways that were hard for me to convey because in some ways the dynamics seem so foreign to us today. And we think when we look at the past, how could people who experienced such grinding subordination still have a meaningful relationship to the law? Why did they think they could use it? Why did they think that it would work for them? But they did. 
And there's something there, that confidence, that hope, that optimism, that belief that you could actually make meaningful change in your life, that realization made me a legal historian. Um, so I think now it's impossible to understand our past without understanding our changing legal order. If nothing else with this talk today, I hope that you come away with an appreciation for that, that our relationship to law was not always what it is today, and that the Civil War and Reconstruction are central to understanding how all that happened. So now, two examples, part two here, which is actually, I guess, part three. Um, but the Civil War and Reconstruction, right, it unleashes this conflict about what the legal order should look like. It created openings for people to express their ideas and new avenues for them to realize them as well. At the same time, they faced real headwinds in the form of entrenched laws and also new policies, ironically, the very ones so many people were trying to mobilize for their own ends. So the first example is the 13th Amendment to the US Constitution, which outlawed slavery. Now, we tend to think of the abolition of slavery as a political issue, right? It's about mobilizing public opinion, mobilizing political leaders. Once you do that, it's all accomplished, end of story. But actually, slavery was also a legal issue, which shaped how emancipation unfolded. The US Constitution creates a layered system of jurisdictional authority, the federal government, states, and local governments in towns, cities, and counties. Now, all of these jurisdictions overlap in the sense that they're all operating simultaneously in the same geographic spaces and often dealing with similar issues. And sometimes they deal with those issues in different ways. But one thing in the first half of the 19th century was very clear, and that was that states controlled the legal status of individuals, which is why states had the power to either sanction or abolish slavery. The federal government had intervened in only limited ways because it could only intervene in limited ways. It could place bans on slavery in territories where the federal government had jurisdiction and in Washington DC where it also had jurisdiction, but it couldn't intervene in states. Now those complications became evident when enslaved people began fleeing to the US army at the outset of the civil war. Now, one of the most famous counters happened at Fort Monroe, a military base, federal military base on the Virginia coast. Now, I am collapsing a very complicated story here, but essentially early in the war, several enslaved men presented themselves to US military officials and basically said that they're being forced to work for the Confederacy. They would prefer not to do that. And they would like US protection and they might be able to actually help the US cause. Now this trickle soon turned into a flood as people fled slavery and sought shelter behind US lines. Now, interestingly here, and something that people don't usually appreciate is that the law underlay what they were doing. In fact, enslaved people were very legally savvy. They did not just declare themselves free or flee to another place where slavery still existed. They knew they had to remove themselves from one legal jurisdiction, states that sanctioned slavery, to another, areas controlled by the US Army and under federal law. Now, even then, these people lived in legal limbo, an illegal limbo created by the very legal order that made, them possi made it possible for them to flee, right? Um, federal law as it existed then could not clarify the legal status of people who escaped from slavery because the whole legal order was set up around the assumption that states handled those questions. In other words, there was no body of federal law that defined the legal status of people who escaped slavery or the legal status of people at all. Before the Civil War, the federal government had freed individuals deemed to have been wrongly enslaved. But that did nothing to change the fact that states still had authority over the institution of slavery and freeing individuals piecemeal one by one did not eliminate slavery as an institution. And that's a problem because as long as the institution of slavery remained legal, people, some of them could remain enslaved and some could be re-enslaved. And even if abolition were eliminated via legislation at the state level, it could always be overturned and reenacted. So what to do? To eliminate the institution of slavery everywhere in the United States, it had to be done via an amendment to the US Constitution. Only an amendment there could give the federal government the authority to act and intervene in affairs that had been reserved to states. That amendment, the 13th Amendment, 13th amendment was in part a result of enslaved people's actions because they were the ones who forced the issue of slavery within federal jurisdictions and made it impossible for federal officials to ignore. 
Now, the 13th Amendment, however, also had unintended consequences. It was the first time that the federal government assumed authority over the legal status of individuals, something that we often forget. While the amendment dealt with slavery, then it established a precedent that the federal government could and should step in to deal with the legal problems of individual Americans. That was new. And as such, an amendment that dealt with slavery introduced the notion that the federal government, once a really distant part of the legal order for most people, would be more present in their lives. Which brings us to example two. Americans took that change to heart and pushed the federal government to involve itself in a wider array of issues in their lives. African Americans started requesting help even before the passage of the 14th Amendment, which expanded the federal government's reach to the oversight of civil rights. Exemplary is a request of a group of African Americans in Tennessee. They're from Lincoln County. It's actually named after a, a revolutionary general, but it still is nice and it all brings it all together. So African Americans, Lincoln County, Tennessee, 1861 who pointed out that the end of slavery did not end the problems faced by those who had once been enslaved. And this group wrote, when we became formally and legally free, our prayers were answered and the secret hopes of our hearts were realized. The problem they wrote was that the state legislature in Tennessee failed to pass the necessary laws to recognize our standing and to secure, to, oh, excuse me, and secure to us by law, our rights as freemen. As we are now, they continued, the old slave laws of the state remain unrepealed and the oath of the colored man not being received in our courts as against the whites, we have nowhere to look for protection, save United States authority. In those authorities, they wrote, we have fullest confidence, but we want some way of easily bringing our cases before them. Should be simple, right? The state would not act. These people are hoping that the federal government would. But therein lies the problem. At this point, before the 14th Amendment, the federal government's jurisdiction did not extend to matters of the kind that plagued this group of African Americans. States' broad authority over the legal status of American people remained unchanged, even after the passage of the 14th Amendment, even after the surrender of Confederate states. It was not just an issue for African Americans who lived in the former Confederacy. It was an issue all over the United States where states and localities routinely restricted the rights of Americans of all kinds, black and white, men and women, and a wide range of ethnic and racial minorities as well. Those issues were akin to the ending of slavery in the sense that states had power over that, the federal government did not. And they required drastic change in the form of a constitutional amendment. Now, the story of how that amendment, the 14th Amendment, came to be is long and dramatic. And there are definite parallels to the 13th Amendment in the sense that it did not spring fully formed from the minds of congressional representatives. It was the result of organized activism led by Blacks and their white allies that reached way back into the antebellum period. During and after the war, that effort was joined by recently freed African Americans, like the group of uh, petitioners from Tennessee, who demanded action to address their legal problems. Now, how it came to be is a very compelling tale, and I urge you to go find that elsewhere, because we must move forward here and talk about the implications. So the 14th Amendment is passed, and it only goes so far. Now, we expect the 14th Amendment today to do a lot, but it only gave the federal government oversight over states with the explicit promise that citizens could now claim rights, okay. But then there were the more vague promises that states could not restrict those rights. It did not hand out though equal civil rights to people. And it did not establish a group of protected rights that citizens could claim. In fact, it did not define civil rights at all. And that was a real issue because it was not entirely clear what that term civil rights encompassed at the time. And I should add that civil rights are still a moving target, uh, which is part of my point in this section, actually. Um, what rights are is defined in part by what people think about them and the actions that they take to realize those ideas. The 14th Amendment's predecessor, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, did list out civil rights, and that provided something of a guide, but it was also somewhat disappointing because the act suggests how limited the term was at the time. The rights enumerated in the Civil Rights Act were the ones individuals needed to claim property, to exchange property, and to access the courts. 
Now, Americans from all over the social and economic spectrum, in fact, had far more expansive ideas about what rights meant at the time. Um, and for them, rights were flexible and powerful. They really were about very broad claims to justice that they thought the government should support and protect. And one of the classic examples is African-Americans claims to access to public carriers and public spaces, such as streetcars, sidewalks, and parks. Now, in the mid 19th century, um, those kinds of issues were legally handled as social rights, which were different from civil rights. Now, civil rights um, were determined by states and applied universally within state and local jurisdictions. If abridged by a local government or lower courts, appeal could be made to the state. By contrast, social rights were different. They were locally determined and there was no prospect for appeal. So there's a patchwork of social rights that existed all over the United States locally determined. So think about this for a second. In this period, towns, cities, counties made laws that created and maintained a variety of inequalities, including segregation. When they did, end of story. There was no appeal to change that situation. But during and after the Civil War, African-Americans challenged that whole calculation and they claimed access to public spaces as a civil right and demanded the intervention of state and federal authority to uphold their claims. Now, to be sure, they did not achieve success until the 20th century, but even before they achieved victory, they had altered conceptions of what civil rights were and included access to public spaces within that rubric. And that also was accomplishing a great deal because they shifted the whole terms of the debate. And as they were arguing, civil rights were not just about individuals, property and access to the courts. They were also about remaking the social order, the very terrain in which people moved and lived their lives. Rights, they were arguing, were about social justice. Now, African-Americans were not the only people to use the 14th Amendment and its protection of rights to pursue their interests and ultimately their visions of a just society. Notably, women's activists tried to use the amendment to dismantle gender inequalities, although those efforts were also were not realized until the late 20th century, enter Ruth Bader Ginsburg, among other people. But the amendment was not solely linked to progressive causes or what we would think of as progressive causes today. Business leaders in the late 19th century also ran over themselves to make use of the 14th Amendment. Um, and they did so to extend the rights of business owners over their property and over their workers. Um, they used it to free themselves from public regulations that had been in place and were widely followed and used during the first half of the 19th century. And they also used it to give corporations some of the same rights as individuals, which you also see that pattern um, increasing and accelerating today. Now, as this example suggests, the one with business leaders using the 14th Amendment, rights had a long history. They were firmly linked to individuals' claims to property and made it easy for those with property, businesses, corporations, to pick them up and use them. They also worked in relationship to other parts of the legal system that tended to put rights out of reach for many people. So take women, for instance. Women, as women, could claim rights but not if they were married women because marriage invoked coverture, which not only suspended rights for wives, but also gave their husbands rights to their children, their earnings and their property. In the 19th century, new laws gave married women rights to property they brought into marriage and also right to their wages. But other laws made it possible at the same time to restrict women's employment, which meant that they had fewer work options and they always earned less than men. One result was that most married women then did not work for a wage. They contributed through their unwaged domestic labor to their household's economy. And existing laws then, though, denied wives rights in family property that was accumulated during marriage. So they could work to build up through various means the family's property, but all of that belonged to the husband, given the ways that marital property and women's rights were framed. So it essentially turns the value of their labor over to their husbands. You can change rights in one area, but if you leave the whole other system of laws in place, it limits what rights can do. So those white men had rights, including rights to the value of their wives' unwaged labor. 
But if they work for wages, the labor relationship suspended many of those rights on the workplace and even beyond. Employers could dictate what laborers did out on the job and also off the job, determining where uh, workers worshiped, where they shopped, how they dressed, how they spent their leisure time, how they, they were paid and where they lived. So even those white men who we assume had, you know, all these rights on the job that limited their rights. And then because they were workers and had, the employers had some connection to them even when they weren't on the job, they could also then determine other parts of their lives. Then in the late 19th century as well, people of color were no longer subject to slavery and could in theory enjoy civil rights and political rights too, but those changes did nothing to disturb legal principles that allowed state and local governments to modify or negate everyone's rights in the name of the public good. Everyone's, anyone's rights could be abridged at any point if it was seen as being in the public interest. Um, that was a legal basis for segregation. It was also the legal basis for the laws restricting women. Federal courts ruled that state and local governments could discriminate, keeping people of color out of public spaces, for instance, in the name of the public good. They also ruled that state and local governments could discriminate against women uh, because they were women and needed the protection of federal and state law, which of course had the effect of limiting what they could do and defining and circumscribing their lives. So after the Civil War, many people hoped that rights would promote social justice, but they ran into another vision of the social order, this other parts of the legal system that was tied to white supremacy, to patriarchy, and also to the protection of property. Those elements remain deeply rooted in parts of the legal order that remain untouched by reconstruction and actually untouched for the next hundred or so years. So the fragile rights of precariously positioned individuals were no match for laws that still supported inequality, despite the extension of rights to new portions of the population. And at the same time, those other parts of the legal system became less accessible, more difficult to change, more difficult for people to reach. So that's not a happy ending, um, but I think there's a happy ending in this final part for the rest of us today. So this book is about the past and it stops at a moment in the past, um, but I think it has some hope for the way that we can move forward. So first there's our relationship to law and the legal system. I think that we are too quick sometimes today to think of law as something outside our comprehension, as arcane, as a set of rules that only those with specialized training can fathom. Those assumptions lie at the center of the way we see the history of law. And in particular, we think of change in law in terms of who had access to the legal system. We chart a history in which rights, and we assume we know what those were, were slowly extended to more groups, first property to less white men, then men of color, and then to all women. But we do not focus on the history of the rights, of those rights, and the labor that it takes to actually expand those rights out and fill them up with meaning. We overlook changes in our understanding of what constituted a right, why, and what those rights could accomplish. And we miss the fact that ordinary people were central in filling rights with meaning, of actually defining them in ways that were meaningful in their lives and that could result in substantive change. That's a lot of work, um, but it's also very empowering. It opens up new ways of thinking about the law, how we might achieve real substantive change through the law and how that is actually within our hands, not so far away from possibility. And at the same time, I think that we need to have more respect for the law and its power. Law is not infinitely malleable and it exists within a complicated system with many moving parts. So in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, rights were part of a body of law that protected property. It protected the interests of wealthy people. Read John Locke if you doubt that in any way, shape or form. To rely on that body alone um, to achieve egalitarian goals then comes with challenges. You're using a body of law that was in fact designed to uphold inequalities. Now, those are not insurmountable challenges, but they're ones that need to be recognized. And then rights also exist within a system that has other ways of thwarting change. 
again, not insurmountable ones, but ones that need to be recognized. Rights alone cannot accomplish always what we want them to do. There needs to be other changes. There needs to be also other changes in the way that we understand how we interact with the legal order, and also in terms of the politics that support all of them. We can't just expect the law to solve our problems. But that said, none of that, none of those challenges stopped people in the past from trying to use law to realize change in their lives because law was embedded in their lives in ways that they could see. Um, we don't see that in quite the same way now, but I think we should stop and notice and open our eyes to how it is all around us. And then we should use it. And the challenges didn't stop people in the past and it shouldn't stop us today. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Edwards, for those absolutely fascinating, fascinating meditations on what I think of as the most central period in American history, at least for understanding our time. And I will ask you to challenge or, or test that assumption in just a moment. But um, I'm, I'm struck by something that, um, that you said, which is that for many people who were relatively powerless in the late 19th century, African Americans, that is to say freed people in particular, women, workers, the expansion of federal authority could be seen as a tool to, uh, to um, reduce oppression by state and local authorities. And yet today we have, um, uh, for many Americans, the, the federal government is seen as a source of overweening authority. Now for anyone who lives in a homeowners association and knows that if you choose Tope over Puce, you can lose your house uh, to, a, to a lien, we know that real tyranny can actually operate at the local level. But that general sense of authority as being oppressive from the top is somewhat widespread in American life. How did that flip? Or is there a, a way in which the, the reconstruction period can inform that? You know, this sense of the, the clear hierarchy that we have now, where you have the federal government that is, you know, obviously supreme, and then you have state governments, and then you have local governments, and that hierarchy was not as clear in the 19th century, uh, partly because the jurisdiction, the issues that all of those areas of government dealt with were different. And so this federal government was above, but it didn't deal with a lot of the issues in people's daily lives. So it was a very distant authority. And in that sense, it, it, it seems small. It's small if only because it's so far away, right? In the distance, your perspective is such that you know, the, it looks little, even though it might be big in other contexts, it, for most people's lives, it looked very small. Um, and then state governments also delegated a lot of authority to local communities. So while states in theory had a lot of authority over rights and status, they would then give over discretion about how to apply those rules to local communities. And so there was a sense that you know, local communities for many people, that's where most of the power resided in terms of the decisions made in their daily lives about you know, conflicts between neighbors, about property disputes, about you know, ordering society if somebody slaps somebody upside the face, then they take it down to a local magistrate. Um, so all of the kind of hands-on authority was being done in local communities. But then the Civil War alters all of that because it brings the federal government into people's lives. And the federal government is both the Confederacy, Confederate federal government, and then also the US federal government. Mm -hmm. So you have you know, armed troops running around who represent federal authority. And that makes a huge, enormous difference in the context, for instance, of Confederate states where you have enslaved people have, you know, federal authority there present who they can go to and provide shelter and another space of, of authority that they can draw on to contest what's going on in their states and local areas. So there is a sense in the 19th century that they're different arenas and you can draw on different arenas of jurisdictions of local, state and federal government. Um, and if the federal government's there and they can help you, why not try and access that? If the state government's there and they can help you, well, you could try that too. Um, but you're looking for the jurisdiction that is going to promote your interests um, and that will be the most responsive to you. So there's a lot of forum shopping in this period mm -hmm. and people are not necessarily seeing the federal government as 
quite in, as involved in their lives. And I think that's also part of why people have such hope here. It's like, oh, cool. They seem to be here. They have an interest in what I'm, I'm interested in. They seem to be promoting my, my goals. So let's try to bring them on board here. Um, but the, what changes is all of these policies that allow people to access that federal power. It's closer to them, and then they're able to access it because of the changes with reconstruction. Otherwise, you know, the federal government could have been there. It's like, I'm sorry, we can't help you. I mean, so you're enslaved. I can't do anything about that necessarily. Um, and those policy changes are what actually put the federal government into people's lives. Another of the, the really striking things you introduced us to in this conversation and in your book as well is your, your comment that 19th century Americans were quite optimistic about the law and what the law could do for them. That sense of, as you put it, forum shopping seems like part of that sense that the law could work for them in various ways. And you seem to be saying that people did not just use law, they also expected to have a say in how it was defined. Yeah. You know, what's the difference and why is that important? You know, today, I think we look at law in a more hands-off way. Um, it's an arm's distance, right? So you have a problem, you're trying to use the law to solve the problem. And then in the 19th century, people saw that law is more malleable in the sense that here's a legal principle, the idea that we should order society in a just way, um, that the public good should be foremost in the way that we're imagining laws to be applied. Um, and that's a really sort of amorphous abstract legal principle. But if you take that legal principle and then you have people coming to a local court, um, they're saying, my interest is in the public good. Um, and they're imagining there that they can fill up that content with something of their own vision, right? So the idea about African-Americans, for instance, having access to public space, right? They're taking civil right, a right, and they're saying, I should be able to define what that is. Um, if in fact, you know, laws are there to promote good order and justice, then I can come in and this is my vision of what's good order and justice, equal access to public space. And so we will redefine what a civil right is because we should be able to do that, right? Um, isn't that what the law is about? Uh, so there is a sense here that you have a general principle, but then you get to fill that in with some meaning as well. So people aren't using a preformed law. They're taking these ideas and then filling them up with their own sense of what the law means. This, I might add, getting back to the whole point of this, leads to conflict, right? Um, so people do not all agree on what constitutes a good society or how people should um, be ordering you know, their lives. And so you're gonna have lots of conflicts here. Um, it's akin to the example you gave in your condo association where it's taupe versus pumice, hummus, what? Puce, uh, puce. Yes, puce, very, very bad selection. Actually, it might go back to the color wheel. Um, but yes, taupe and puce, right? You're, you're arguing over what color is good. And so law is about conflict, but taupe and puce, that's one thing. But if you're talking about, you know, racial justice, equality, equal access to public space or segregation and subordination, those are huge issues, right? Um, and expecting law then to resolve those, that's also asking a lot. So this kind of system also leads and these expectations while expansive, capacious, optimistic also lead to conflict. Um, and I think understanding that is also appreciating what happens with the civil war and reconstruction, but also the conflicts that we experience in our society all the time. We expect law to do a lot for us. And it is about introducing conflicts and then resolving those conflicts. Um, but yes, it is inevitably going to run into conflict there. One of our viewers asked the question, could you say more about changes and how people thought about and engaged with lawyers before and after the Civil War? And she follows up by saying, can we see the shift that you observed that is about how people thought about law here in this relationship between people's relationships with lawyers? 
Yeah, um, it's a great question. And there's all this literature in the early 19th century that is very denigrating of lawyers. Um, you know, they're the parasites of society, they're making money off of other people and their problems. Um, they're, they're just, they're, 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 they're a really kind of low breed of professional, right? Um, and in fact, the Knights of Labor, a um, labor organization in the late 19th century, at, they list out all of the, the problems in society and lawyers are among them. So, you know, and they would not let lawyers, you know, join their organization because it's like beyond the pale. So there's a sense that lawyers are sort of profiting off of people's engagement in the law. And, and, and there is a point, people have a point here because you hire a lawyer, the lawyer costs money and the lawyer is then settling legal disputes. People felt like it would be better if they could resolve those legal disputes themselves, right? But a lawyer can be helpful. Um, over time, lawyers start interposing themselves in all kinds of cases. Um, so civil cases involving property often and usually involved lawyers. And again, they're taking a cut of all of this. And some of the stuff is kind of basic property transactions. So you, things that we would deal, use banks to deal with today, like uh, credit, um, basic kinds of trans transactions that way, you would have to have a lawyer involved in that. So you use lawyers a lot in economic dealings, not so much in criminal matters and other kinds of public law areas. But then over time, lawyers start inserting themselves into those public law areas where, you know, it's fights amongst neighbors, it's, you know, a fist fight that goes sideways and it results in assault charges, um, sort of petty chronic violence. Um, lawyers start intervening in all of those cases as well. And pretty soon um, you have lawyers imposing kinds of procedural rules on cases that used to be discussed in terms of the substance. So for instance, let me give you an example. I'm working on a book on textiles right now. And you would have people who uh, were contesting like ownership of a sheet, for instance, and someone had loaned it or sold it, they expected more than for it than what was paid. And there's this, you know, conflict and they take it to the courts. One person ultimately will say, well, she stole my sheet, but it's actually about the fact that she didn't get the price for the sheet that she wanted. Now, ordinarily, back in the early 19th century, they would kind of work this out and it would be about, well, who actually owned the sheet? What was the price that was promised? Did the person end up paying the amount. So it's really focused on you know, the meat of the issues there, who really owns the sheet and why. When you get the interposition of lawyers, it's more about process and proceedings. It's like, well, did you fill out the paperwork right? And this moves a lot of these issues away from the real meat of people's concerns in their lives, who owns the sheet and why, and into a more of a process issue about whether you filled the paperwork out right and whether you're following the process in the appropriate way. Um, and so all of this tends to move the law. They, it transforms the law into something that is more about rules and process. And it also moves it away from the real concerns of people's lives and the way that they used to work through those conflicts um, in legal forums and also then move their ideas about how you exchange property into the law or other issues, you know, who should be um, punished for a fight, under what circumstances is violence inappropriate, um, the kinds of cases where wives brought domestic violence cases, for instance, get harder and harder to bring because these questions about what is appropriate violence under what circumstances moves into a procedural matter that is more about can wives bring a case at all against their husbands? And the answer would be no. So the interposition of lawyers shifts all of these issues and has the effect of kind of moving things away from ordinary people's lives. Um, what's interesting is that we've all kind of accepted that now. So we all kind of assume that lawyers know these things and we don't. And in the early 19th century, that was not the case. So you would find people in court cases, um, they'd be kind of shoving their lawyer out of the way and be like, no, no, what I want to say is this. Um, it, we don't do that anymore. Um, we give a lot more deference to lawyers. Well, I want to preface this next question by stating, I guess, the obvious, which is one of the great uh, legal dramas of our time is happening right now. Actually, it, even competing with us on YouTube, um, where this uh, conversation is being hosted. 
And of course, I'm referring to the impeachment trial, the second impeachment trial of former President Donald Trump. Um, the conversation we've been having um, is mostly about the 19th century, about this period, this extraordinary period after the Civil War. Why is the legal history of that period, those years after the Civil War, so important today? That's a big question there, Matthew. <laughs> uh, but I think it's completely, oh, no, I just got done talking to a reporter for the AP today who was asking questions about the 14th Amendment and the third section, which basically says, if you've engaged in insurrection against the United States government, you can't hold federal office, right? So there's kind of a direct link right there. And interestingly, we haven't ever had occasion to revisit the third section of the 14th Amendment until recently, right? Um, and, you know, regardless of how you see former President Trump's actions, there is that question of whether that is insurrection or not. And if you go in that direction, then there's also the 14th Amendment, which would suggest that um, well, we've been down that road before and people were very concerned about exactly that. And exactly that, what I mean is that during the whole reconstruction era, um, there was a sense amongst, especially Republican leaders in the federal government that there needed to be basic understanding about the rules of the road, right? Um, that you had to kind of agree that we're a part of this government, we have certain rules that we're accepting, and if you're not going to do that, then there's a real problem. There's, that was what secession was about. You had people saying, no, I, I, it's not just a difference of opinion, but I've gone to the point where, uh, you know, my whole state is seceding and now we're going to have a violent conflict. Um, so, Yes, there is, first of all, this sense I feel like that we're in now where we are questioning the basic rules about government that are underlying the whole political project. And those rules are, get back to that point about the legal order, right? Um, in order to actually contain conflict, we do need to agree on some of the basic structural rules of you know, what we're doing here, what the law is about. Um, and when you move so far where people can't speak to each other, um, where you're disagreeing on those basic rules, um, for instance, that when you have an election that you need to accede to the results, um, then the legal system begins to fall apart. It can't contain those conflicts anymore. And this gets back, I think, to the point I was making about the importance of law, um, why people believe in it. Um, you believe in it because you think it can resolve those problems. Um, but to believe in it, you also have to accept certain basic rules about how the process works as well. And one of the most basic is that when you have a legal contest or an election, you have winners and you're losers. And you accept the rules and the outcome, and then you move forward. You can try to change things. You can go back and rethink how you would do a court case or rethink, uh, try to change those laws, but you kind of accept the outcome. And this is also something I found really interesting in relationship to this period is that people who had been horribly, horribly exploited and abused by the legal system still had faith in it, namely enslaved people, mm -hmm. because they had a sense that it could promote justice, that there was ways that that could happen. Um, but they were very intent on working within the system, interestingly enough, the people who had been perhaps the most reason to doubt it were the people who were the most intent on using it. Um, and I feel like that's also a lesson here and a cautionary tale for what's happening now. I think there's a connection to this next question. You know, proverbially, every crisis is also an opportunity. Yeah. And one way that this crisis seems to be an opportunity is for millions of us, perhaps all of us who are citizens of the United States, to, be to both better understand the rules that you described, the rules that seem to be forgotten or no longer agreed upon, and also to remind ourselves of our own role in setting our expectations and precedents, uh, the behaviors that we expect in our society that go beyond law. So the question is, why is it so important to include ordinary people in legal history? 
What's wrong with simply ceding the law to lawyers? Well, if you see the law as uh, a way to resolve conflicts, as a way to get to um, and define some of the underlying foundational principles that order our society, ceding it only to lawyers seems somewhat problematic, right? Um, why would you take something that is about such fundamental piece of our society and just hand over power to a small group of people, right? I think that there needs to be um, a more fulsome debate here um, about what constitutes law. So um, let me give you an example. In the early, late 19th century, 20th century, we used to have Supreme Court judges who were not legally trained. They were not lawyers. They didn't come from, you know, particular law schools like we have now or go through the same track from, you know, um, judgeships into the Supreme Court. Um, you had politicians, you had legal scholars or people who thought about the law, but they weren't necessarily trained lawyers. But now we can imagine you know, a Supreme Court that had those kinds of people. But maybe we need to have those kinds of people to think through some of the substantive issues about what is justice. So that, for instance, another example would be some of the debates over impeachment, right? Um, the Republicans are very eager to talk about whether or not this is constitutional, this impeachment at this moment. Because if you do that, you don't actually have to talk about the actual acts that the president did and all of the series of events that unfolded before the election and afterwards that were contesting whether or not the election was valid, right? So you can avoid the substantive issue by talking about process and procedure. Um, and I don't think that that is healthy because, you know, as much as conflict can be difficult and wrenching and sometimes disastrous, um, we need to have those conflicts if we're ever going to settle on, you know, what our society is actually about, what our core principles are, where we're going and what we're doing. Um, so I think that that more substantive approach to justice is also about bringing in the voices of ordinary people and not ceding the law to a few professionals. Yeah, what a powerful argument, I think, for a uh, historical perspective in reshaping the way that, in, in re-examining the assumptions we have about the world that we live in and the rules and the possibilities of that world. Um, I think we have time for another question. And um, I'm gonna ask you another doozy since we like these big questions. <laughs> you know, you've, you've not just said, but also shown throughout this conversation tonight and in your wonderful book, by the way, that rights themselves have a history. And what do you mean by that? And what should we take away from that uh, as, we, as we leave this conversation tonight? I think we assume that rights, we know what they are, that they are these things that are really cool. And rights are things you want, right? And nobody doesn't want a right. Um, and then some people had them and some people didn't, right? And then over time, more people got them. But nobody ever stops and says, well, what is a right? And there are some rights that in the 19th century weren't particularly useful. Um, so for instance, if you have no property, rights that you know, sanction property are not particularly helpful to you if you don't have any property. Um, so you know, rights had, could have limited effect and limited meaning. Um, and as a, a question I pose to my legal history class is often, well, they say, well, you know, African-American women should have equal rights. It's like, well, to whom? African-American men, which means they have like in the late 19th century, very few rights. Or if you're talking about even poor white people, um, women who are poor, they have equal rights to the men who are also poor. It, it's a pretty, you know, disappointing bundle of rights, shall we say. So rights are always unequally distributed through the population and they also mean different things. So rights now today, where it's about public access, where it's about you know, questions of economic equity and justice, that's a very different thing than rights in the early 19th century, which is, well, congratulations, you can file a court case and that's it. Um, and congratulations, you can do that to keep your property. Yay, um, it's not very exciting. And the more expansive vision of rights is actually that hidden history of what 
people did their effort to create this more expansive vision, right? So I feel like that history needs to be told because that history is also about the actual hard work that ordinary people put in to create something more meaningful and expansive there. And if we just assume that rights are something that we hand out like candy, then, then some people get them and then we go, oh, we forgot these people have some. Um, that, that misses the work and effort that went in to make them meaningful. And that work and effort usually involves ordinary people, actually. What a, um, what a liberating and also, I think, um, invigorating vision of citizenship in a society you've just described. And you make me very proud to be associated with the National Humanities Center and to claim you as a fellow <laughs> at the center. <laughs> um, I want to thank you, Laura. And, uh, and to thank you especially for participating on such an extraordinary moment um, in our legal history in the United States. And I also wanna thank a few other people. Um, I want to thank, to every, thank everyone who participated in tonight's conversation by submitting questions and being active listeners in our feed. I want to thank the sponsors of our book club series, Duke University, the Federation of State Humanities Councils, the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, the Research Triangle Park Foundation, the Furman Humanities Center, and Osher Lifelong Learning Institutes at Arizona State University, Duke, Furman, North Carolina State University, the University of Michigan, and listeners like you. This evening's event has been recorded and will be available on the National Humanities Center's YouTube channel. Please click the subscribe button and the notify bell below this video to be notified about future online events. You may also vis visit nationalhumanitiescenter.org to learn more about the National Humanities Center and our programming. Good evening, everyone, and stay well.